welcome back to my channel. It is that time of the month again where I bring you another Pearson comprehensive guide. For those that are new here, this is something that I put out every single month. I focus on a specific Pearson and then I make a comprehensive guide regarding that Pearson. So for this month, the topic is gonna be on cheek piercings. Now this is not something that I have myself, as you can tell. So for the ones that I don't have myself, it does require a little bit more research, but it was pretty interesting what I found out about this one. So hopefully this Pearson comprehensive guide will prove useful to you, whether you're looking to get this Pearson or you already have it and you wanna know a little bit more information. How these Pearson comprehensive guides break down, it focuses on five categories. The first one, what is said Pearson? The procedure and pain of getting said Pearson, the healing and aftercare of said Pearson, and then everyone's favorite parts, jewelry sizing and jewelry options. So let's go ahead and get started with what is a cheek Pearson. So the cheek Pearson, also known as the dimple Pearson, is located on the side of your face right here where your cheeks are. Now I say that it is also referred to as the dimple piercing because usually the location of this type of piercing is where your natural dimples would be. So when you smile, you may or may not have little indentations in your cheeks. Those are your dimples. Some people have more pronounced ones than others, but that is typically where this piercing goes. Most of the time this will be done with just a regular hollow needle, but there's also the method of having a dermal put in your cheek instead of just having the needle go straight through your cheek. But for the sake of this video, because that one's a little bit more rare to do, I'm just gonna focus on how it's done with a needle. This is one piercing that you definitely have to be careful with because it will swell a lot. It's already pretty thick. Like this is something that I didn't think about before researching this piercing, is just how thick your cheek actually is, which can make this piercing a little bit more difficult than you would imagine. So it's already a thick placement, but then on top of that, once it's done, it swells a lot. So something that you have to keep in mind is that swelling. As I mentioned, placement for the cheek piercing is usually where your natural dimples will be. Again, some people have more prominent dimples than others, but you gotta be careful that it doesn't go too far back because if it gets too far back, like toward your molars, it can pose a lot of problems. And the reason why this is also called a dimple piercing is because it does create the look of permanent dimples once it's healed and once the jewelry is removed. So now that you know exactly which piercing I am referencing in this video, let's move on to the procedure and pain of getting one done. So again, I do not have this piercing, but from what I found online, the majority of people say that this is relatively pain-free to get done. Not like completely pain-free, but it's like getting your lip pierced. So some say that it ranges kind of in the middle on a scale of one to 10, one being nothing, 10 being awful. A lot of people say that it's like a four or five, right in the middle of the road. Again, like I mentioned earlier, the cheek is pretty thick, so it's definitely thicker than like, say, getting your lip pierced, but because it is a fleshier area, it's not as bad as say, getting cartilage pierced. So getting this piercing done, it's much like other piercings in the sense that piercer will look at your anatomy, see exactly where the best placement is, sterilize, mark the placement, let you look at it. You're not gonna want it to go too far back, so what your piercing marks is probably going to be what you want to go with. However, if you're really not feeling it, definitely speak up. There's also the fact that your piercer is going to be looking to avoid specific areas of your cheek, specifically something called the parotid duct. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but that is something that they want to avoid. They do not want to pierce that at all. So that's why they want to keep a little bit closer to your smile instead of going too far back. And again, your piercer will locate where your current dimples are. Some people may have more prominent dimples than others. Others, so it may be a little bit easier to find that placement on others than some, but they're gonna look for where your actual dimples are and that will become the placement for your cheek piercings. Since this is an oral piercing, your piercer will have you rinse your mouth, swish your mouth out with an oral rinse just so that the bacteria on the inside of your mouth can be cleaned out too. And like I say often, piercers choose to use or not use clamps. It's definitely a personal preference. Some piercers feel that it gets in the way and is a little bit more of a hindrance. Other find the stability very helpful when doing piercings. So if your piercer choose to freehand it, don't freak out and be like, oh my God, mine didn't use a clamp, is that wrong? It's usually up to the preference of the piercer. However, the videos I did find online showed more people using the clamp than not just because it is a bigger area and it's a little bit fleshier and moves a little bit easier. But again, 
it's up to their personal preference. All right, now on to everyone's absolute favorite part, healing and aftercare. And yes, that was sarcasm. So cheek piercings take a long time to heal surprisingly. Again, I'm comparing a lot of the cheek piercing to lip piercings, but then a lot of comparisons do not cross over, such as healing time. Lip piercings don't take that long to heal. Cheek piercings, on the other hand, do. They can take up to a year to heal. A lot of places say six months just because of the swelling that you will deal with. This piercing is prone to irritations and swelling, so it's definitely something to keep in mind when getting it done. There's also a lot of piercers who won't do this piercing because of those things. They don't have anything specifically against the piercing, they just know that it's a very tedious journey to heal it. And when it comes to healing the piercing and aftercare with it, pretty much standard. You can either use your own homemade solution or you can use a pre-made solution. I definitely recommend Neil Med. And if you're looking to get a pre-made rinse. I do have a code. It is in the description below if you're interested, but I really find the Neil Med spray to be incredibly helpful when it comes to oral piercings because it has a curved nozzle. So instead of just going straight up and out, it's a little bit of a curve, makes it a little bit easier to get inside your mouth. But again, you can either make your own or use a pre-made one. If you make your own, please, please, please make sure that you are using the correct measurements. Correct measurements are eight ounces of distilled or bottled water. Don't use tap water. There's things in tap water that's not really good for a brand new piercing. And with that, you're gonna mix one eighth of a teaspoon to one fourth of a teaspoon of non-iodized sea salt. I said, non-iodized sea salt, not iodized, non-iodized. I've had that question before, so I feel like I have to make sure that it's heard non-iodized sea salt. You mix that together and then you can do like a Q-tip on the outside of it, little cotton round on it, little compress that you can put on it. And for the inside, you can kind of swish around with it. Or if you're doing the pre-made one, just spray it directly onto it. Other things to make sure that you're not using on this piercing or any piercing are things like Neosporin or alcohol products or Bactine. As always, Bactine even tells you to not use their products on piercings. If the company is telling you not to use their product, it's probably best not to use their product. Alcohol products are way too strong for a brand new piercing and will dry it out and kill good bacteria along with the bad bacteria. And then the issue with Neosporin is that it clogs the puncture wound, which is technically what your piercing is, and doesn't allow it to drain, which is what you need it to do. You definitely want it to be able to drain. And that's what the crusties are that typically form around a piercing. So yes, you can clean those away, but you want those to form because that shows that the piercing is draining itself out, is pushing the bad stuff out. But if you put Neosporin on there, it can't do that. As always, don't mess with the jewelry. And this one's gonna be a whole lot easier said than done because it is an oral piercing and you think about how much your cheeks move when you're talking, when you're eating, when you're drinking. Heck, even when you're just not doing anything, you can mindlessly do things, you know, like just do little things like that where you're making like movements with your cheeks. It's gonna be a whole lot easier said than done when it comes to not messing with your jewelry. And remember, this is an oral piercing so you are gonna need to make sure that you're rinsing the inside of your cheeks as well. So something that I like to do whenever I get a brand new oral piercing, especially if I'm eating or drinking something, is to rinse my mouth out with water after I've consumed whatever it is. Now this is not something that you should just be doing all the time. You're gonna wanna use that salt solution, but if you're out and about, you've gotten some lunch, gotten some dinner somewhere, you wanna make sure that food is not stuck around that jewelry. So you're gonna wanna take some water, just rinse it out and spit out that water. And again, if you have that bottle of like Neil Med because it has the pointed nozzle, you can just kind of aim it into your mouth at the piercing site and let it rinse that way. Like I mentioned before, make sure you're clearing away those crusties, even though they're good, cause that shows that your piercing is draining. You wanna make sure that they don't build up. You wanna get rid of them. And as always, I know a lot of people don't really like the use of Q-tips. I personally don't have problems with them, but it's one of those things where you just gotta remember that the little fibers from the Q-tips can wrap around the jewelry and cause irritation. So make sure that that's not happening, if you're using Q-tips, that is. All right, now that you know those fun things about taking care of your cheek piercing, let's move on to everyone's favorite part, jewelry. We're gonna start with jewelry sizing. Typical sizing for cheek piercings are either a 14 gauge or a 16 gauge. You're definitely not gonna go much smaller than that. But the problem with going too much larger than that is that the jewelry can weigh down on the cheek piercings, can weigh down on the cheek, and it can lead to potential rejection. Bars are gonna be very long in the beginning like an inch in length because your cheeks are gonna swell so much. So that jewelry is gonna be annoying. Something to keep in mind though is to make sure that you don't accidentally bite down on the bars because they're gonna be so long due to swelling. Over the course of your cheek piercings healing, you are gonna size down a lot. You also might 
size back up because the swelling might just come in waves. You don't really know. You can't really tell what your body's gonna do. One day it's gonna be fine. The next day you're like, oh my God, I look like a chipmunk. So bars can go up to an inch in length or even longer than that. And yes, that is pretty long. And downsizing will absolutely be necessary to avoid damaging your teeth, like accidentally biting on it or it rubbing against your teeth. Downsizing is necessary, but you also don't wanna downsize too soon because then it can be too tight and your piercing will not be happy. So what does that leave us for? jewelry options. Not much really. Your jewelry options are pretty limited to barbells. That is pretty much all you can do. However, you can do fun little ends on them. You can do either balls or like flat backs or pointed or something like that on the inside. I would probably suggest flat backs just to avoid more damage to your teeth, but you're pretty much limited to just barbells. And again, size and like length will vary a lot just depending on how thick your cheek is and what the swelling is like. So that is it for this piercing comprehensive guide regarding cheek piercings. Let me know in the comments below if you yourself have cheek piercings, have had them before, or thinking about getting them. If you've had them before and have taken them out, how do your dimples look? Because I know that's why a lot of people end up getting the cheek piercings is because they like that dimple look. But then there's also people who just like the piercings in general. So like, do you still have the jewelry in? Did you take it out and achieve the effect that you were going for? Are you thinking about getting this piercing? Is it because you want the dimples? Leave all that in the comments below. I am curious. Special thank you to my patrons. You can help support the channel on Patreon while having access to videos early, viewing patron only content and more. But that is it for this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to give it a big thumbs up. Don't forget to go down there and hit that subscribe button as well as that notification bell so YouTube will let you know when I upload next. But until next time, Bye, all.